welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Uh, pleasure to welcome the program. Uh, a, a real honest to God scholar of long standing and a person who's reached out through the media in terms of understanding the human condition, particularly from uh, a, a standpoint of being interested in political science and the political process on the planet. And that's Benjamin Barber. And he's a, he's a very well established figure, knows great many of people, and has been a great contributor, has written widely and interestingly on the human condition. And Benjamin Barber, welcome enormously to Conversations. It's so an nice honor to welcome you. Thank you. Nice to be back. Yeah, we I did was a here program. years ago, and yeah. was, we had a terrific time. We did back that then, program too. about your very good book, Consumed. Yeah. But I wonder, maybe we could, be, it, it, you know, thumbnail. Your background, born and raised a little bit educated. Born and raised in, in New York City of a uh, theater family. My mm. father was a founder of the group theater, the federal theater, Yale Drama School. My mother was a Broadway playwright and then a writer for radio and television. I grew up in Greenwich Village, uh -huh, uh -huh. went to Europe yeah. for much of my college time, Albert Where? Schweitzer College in Where? Switzerland, the London School of Economics in okay. England. Came back and did a master's and PhD at Harvard in political philosophy, political theory, okay. and worked both in the theater in the 1960s and 70s as well as in political science as a scholar. Uh -huh. I've taught at the University of Pennsylvania, yeah. at Rutgers University, at Princeton, uh, at the University of Maryland, and other places for a shorter time, uh -huh. Oxford and uh, uh, the uh, the Ecole Normale in, in Paris. Uh -huh. So I've been yeah. around, spent a lot of time in Europe, and uh -huh. I've worked as a political theorist interested in both the theory uh -huh. and the practice of democracy. Uh, yeah. What okay. does democracy require theoretically, but also mm -hmm. what is, uh, how does it work? What are the conditions for democracy, whether in America, whether in Egypt and Tahir Square, whether mm -hmm. in Britain, whether in China? Mm -hmm. A huge subject, democracy. It is indeed. They had uh, democracy. Did they have democracy in uh, Pericles in Greece? Is that where we get the well, word? Here's the thing. There are two and ways what to does define it. Mean? it. Yeah. Two ways to define it. Yeah. If by democracy you mean everybody participates, mm -hmm. it's not clear everybody, anybody's ever had that. Even today, though, everybody yeah. is supposed to participate in America. It's only ha ideal? only it's half the population did. But back in ancient Athens, yeah. the population of about 100,000. Yeah only about 19,000 actually were allowed to participate at the founding of America, not yeah. just did African Americans and Indians not participate, mm -hmm. but women didn't participate. And yeah. indeed, in many of the states from mm -hmm. 17, up yeah. until 1789, only mm -hmm. men with property, white men with property, were right. the only ones who could vote. So yeah. you know yeah. what we've been doing is opening up the franchise yeah. more and more over time. More and more people are voting, but democracy means less and less because voting means less and less. Yeah, uh, but in the same time, democracy is a huge word that has great meaning in terms of the human aspiration, does it, it does not? Because and it should be well defined in both practical and theoretical terms, and that's what you're concerned with. It is, and uh -huh. what, it's, what ultimately democracy yeah. is, is the right of every man mm -hmm. and every woman mm -hmm. in a society mm -hmm. to participate in making the laws under which we have to live, sharing in the power which determines the nature of our life. We all are going to have to live under power, like it or not. It's the nature of the world. Do we share in that power? Do mm -hmm. we share in making the laws we live under? Or does somebody else, whether it's a brute tyrant or a benevolent dictator, make laws for us? That's the fundamental question of democracy. The aspiration of democracy is that we all play some role mm -hmm. in both making the laws under which we live and sharing the power that determines our destiny. Is there a difference between, uh, let's say, a representative democracy and what would be called a participatory democracy? And are there any examples moving toward, honest to God, participatory demo democratic order anywhere? Well, you just gave in your question a short history of democracy because mm -hmm. democracy started uh -huh. in small towns, uh, town hall in meetings. principalities, mm -hmm. and it was direct. Uh -huh. People, the ancient Agora, the uh -huh. ancient yeah. polis was uh -huh. a place where Athenians who were participants, not all were, but those who were participated in making the laws. But as the yeah. size and scale of our societies grew yeah. through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period, mm -hmm. and where instead of a polis of 100,000 citizens mm -hmm. that you had in ancient Athens, you had four million Englishmen or four million Frenchmen. Okay. You couldn't very well have a gathering of four million people. It would be impractical. People. And at that time, yeah. the idea came, and it was a saving idea, because yeah. a lot of people thought democracy would not survive scale, mm -hmm. too big, and the brilliant idea of representation came. We can't govern ourselves directly, but if we choose those who govern us, if we mm -hmm. choose the representatives who mm -hmm. govern us, we will at least indirectly control legislation, and we will control 
self governance that way so representative democracy became the somewhat weaker but real democratic device by which we rescued democracy in an age of scale i think that's very very interesting in itself where some people say ben franklin was in touch with the iroquois democracy they had a democratic order and we learned something about what we were going to establish here in 1776 and again, from that, and it would be interesting. Right. Were there ever examples? When I said participatory, I meant mass participatory democracy. Well, here's what, is what I was getting at. Well, as you say, mm -hmm. the, the founders were interested in the Indian confederations yeah. because they were directly engaged. Switzerland, my first book back in the early '70s was yeah. about Switzerland, and in Switzerland, where power devolved mm -hmm. onto 22 cantons. Mm -hmm. In the cantons, yeah. every canton had a Landesgemeinde, a place where all the citizens came together and met Landesgemeinde, a community of the province. Town hall? In effect. Town hall well, it wasn't, but it, was out, it wasn't town hall because no. there was no town. There, there were too many people. It was outdoors. It was literally in the mountainside. They would gather in a, you know, out, outside uh -huh. once a year and they would pass laws, they would make decisions, and there you would have anywhere from a couple of thousand to maybe 10,000 people, but already you were pressing the edges, the limits uh -huh. of direct democracy. Because of scale. The scale, you can't. I mean, how do you have a conversation with 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, a million people? Very hard to do. So at right. that point, you begin to say, let's choose representatives, let's have political parties, they'll represent us, the political parties will have leaders, those leaders will represent the parties and us, and we will vote not for the laws under which we live, but we will vote for the people who make the laws. And that, in effect, is the representative democracy we have today. It's a saving institution, but here's the problem. Yeah. The minute mm -hmm. you start allowing delegates to make laws for you, to govern on your behalf, democracy is reduced not to direct participation, but to voting once a year. So as some critics would say yeah. of representative democracy, we're free one day a year yeah. on election day. Or and the fact. rest of the time, we're living under an elective aristocracy, an elective tyranny. People we've chosen, yeah. but we don't really control. Once they get to Washington, once they get to Albany, once they get to the state capitol, once they get into City Hall, once they didn't get into Gracie Mansion, uh -huh. I mean, Bloomberg, you may like him or don't like yeah. him, but you have one chance to say that yeah, uh -huh. every couple of years, and after that, they govern. So the problem with representative democracy, it preserves the essential feature of democracy mm -hmm. that we choose the governors. Mm -hmm. But once they're chosen, they do all the work of democracy and citizens begin to get alienated, disdainful. We begin to talk about government not as us and we, but as them and as it. And a lot of what you see in the Tea Party today and people who are very critical of democracy and government is that they don't see government as us, our institutions, our representatives, they see it as some cold, alien bureaucracy doing the work of elites that doesn't have anything to do with the American people. But it does reflect a certain reality. Greg Palace says the best money democracy can buy. There you are. Or that kind of thing. Because once you've got, got representatives, then the people can buy the representatives. And you have lobbyists, you have K Street, all you that, have all, all that, that kind of thing as part of the thing. But in well, fairness, we live, Harold, yeah. in a world yeah. in which mm -hmm. you have a choice. Mm -hmm because direct democracy in a country of 300 million like ours, let alone say India with 1.3 billion, right. is never going to be direct at the federal, the central level. You're gonna have to have representatives. Here's the trick yeah. though. In places like India, in places yeah. like the United States, yeah, or China. in places like Germany, or China. Well, mm. China's not yet democratic, but I'm mm. talking about the places that are democratic. If you well, want to, okay. you're going to need a mix. You're going to have a mixed system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And with central uh -huh. government, you're mm. going to have representation. You're going to have deputies doing it. But you can still, as we do here at the states, we have referendum and initiative. Initiative at, in New England today, they still have town meetings. I'm a member of the town meeting in Richmond, Massachusetts. Okay. Where you go and make your own laws. So you can have a mixed system. Uh -huh. You can have a system where in local affairs people participate a lot but in national affairs we defer to chosen representatives who then do most of the real lifting yeah that kind of thing would have to be done uh, how about historically we had a thousand years after Rome we had a feudal order we had dynastic states there was a feudal order and they called themselves I think they be called the Anjan regime there was a regime in terms of the kings and the royal heads of the various dynastic states and they were assumed to be uh, the source of legitimate authority within the area. Yeah, they, were, they was assumed for a thousand years. Well, even more, 50, I mean, if you think about the end of the Athenian and Spartan polis okay. in 350, 380 BC, you think about the end of the Roman Republic, 
with the okay, coming yeah, of Caesar, right, right. for 1,500 years, you didn't have any democracy. You had mm -hmm. empire, you had feudalism, you had local uh, vassals running their local show, and the rest were serfs. The people were not free men. There were a few men and women who were considered free men, but very few. It wasn't really till the rise in the 14th and 15th century in the Renaissance right. of yeah. principalities, yeah. of free towns, uh -huh. of city-states like Florence, yeah. that people began again to think about, maybe we can do this ourselves. Maybe we can begin to do it ourselves. And then, of course, with the settling of the United States, of not then the United States, but of America, the American colonies, in the 16th and 17th century, people realizing they were far enough away from the <laughs> British yeah. crown right. that at least in local affairs there mm -hmm. could be a Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There could be Pennsylvania communities yeah. that right. govern themselves. And you got then in the 16th and 17th century the beginnings of the growth of democracy. At first, many of those institutions imitated the institutions of the ancient sure, world, yeah. Roman Republic, Spartan and Athenian uh, polis, yeah. but it quickly became apparent even in the United States because, yeah. for example, in 1789, at the time we ratified our constitution, yeah. Yeah. there were already four million Americans. Four million, that's like four Libya. Million. That, that's four that's million. like Libya's five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. So already yeah, we yeah. had reached the scale where we knew that we couldn't at the national, the new federal government yeah. until then in Philadelphia and yeah. later in Washington, mm. we couldn't have direct democracy. So but we continued to have it yeah. in the New England towns. Yeah. We continued to have it mm. in the freehold counties of, of, of New Jersey. Right. We continue, and to this day, around America, there are still places where there's a fair amount of participation. But you might say participation is local uh -huh. in America, uh -huh. but power is central, and where it is central, it's through our representatives uh -huh. that we govern. Yeah, okay. What was it historically that had, let's say, if it was a thousand or more years after, uh, you know, leading up to, let's see, 1776, you can date with a number of things. Adam Smith published Wealth and Nation, mm -hmm. beginning of capitalism, understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there was the invention that year of the steam engine, mm -hmm. in heralding an industrial revolution that was technologically, or in terms of our overall capability, destined mm -hmm. to change from an agricultural base and all that sort of thing. And then you had this establishment of, uh, uh, of a unique system across the ocean. It was the, it was the march of history or the development of history, the technological capability, change was coming that caused there to be a questioning of the, uh, the legitimacy, the historical legitimacy of the Anjan regime. It was larger issues that were evolving in terms of the human historical pattern, well, the, or the real, how do we read well, that? And how do we take, the, if, no, I may, if I may, yeah. how do we take that and begin to apply that understanding that there are a larger order mm -hmm. of development and so forth to, uh, let's say, just for instance, the year 2011? Well, here's the key word. You understand? I do. Okay. The key word is capitalism. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the Middle Ages, the early mm -hmm. Renaissance, was a period of feudal relations in which people were bound to one another by fealty, by kinship, by clan, somewhat the way it is in tribal Libya today. But what capitalism yeah, did, mm -hmm. you know, and Marx said it yeah. you know, very directly, that it, dis it disassociated the natural feudal bonds that held us together with individualism, with entrepreneurism, yeah. with trade, the with class mobility. Yeah. Yeah. And all of that yeah. created a society mm -hmm. both that led to large-scale manufacturing industrial nations, right. very large, large-scale, right. couldn't have direct democracy, right. but also led to a much greater interest in property, in liberty, and in individualism, okay. the wherewithal of modern democracy. Mm -hmm. So you had forces that were both making the old regime, the ancien regime, impossible, mm -hmm. but you also had forces that were pushing towards a new interest in liberty, a new interest in privacy, a new interest in rights. And by the time you get to the 17th century and yeah. John Locke, yeah, John the 18th century and Voltaire and Rousseau, Hume, and you Hume, had David people Hume. who were beginning to say, we need societies rooted in social contract in choice mm. uh -huh. and in rights. And that was the rebirth of the ancient ideal of democracy, but in from this Greece, new setting. From Greece? But it all goes but back it, to Greece? Well, yeah, but this, yeah. New, yeah, this okay. new incarnation yeah. uh -huh. was in the wake of large-scale societies that were fueled and pushed forward by capitalism. Uh -huh. And Max you know, Weber wrote Weber, this great yeah. book on yeah. the rise of capitalism and the Protestant ethos. Yeah. That Protestantism, which was born in the 15th century, and capitalism, yeah. which was born in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, had the same drive. Individualism, individual responsibility, the ethic of work, deferred gratification, right. the importance of wealth Protestant for ethic, others. Yeah. Yeah. And that, those two things together created a new mix yeah. of property, liberty, individualism, 
that gave birth to the American nation. And yeah. you might say that Max Weber's notion of a Protestant ethic, mm -hmm. along with a capitalist entrepreneurial ideology, yeah. came together uh -huh. in the New World, uh -huh. in a world that was individualistic, capitalistic, Protestant, Puritan, and that created new forms of democracy. Yeah. But mass democracy now, not small scale direct democracy. Do we call do we associate that with what's used loosely term, let's say the Scottish, uh, David Hume and so with the Scottish Enlightenment or the Enlightenment as opposed to say the French and with the the Enlightenment the, uh, the, the, the w was the was the source of the undercutting or the subsuming of the historically inherited institutions that people were connected to, got their identity in terms of and so forth. Uh, Galileo said he we, we looked at Jupiter with the new microscope uh, telescope and said that the orbit pathways showed that we were not the center of the universe and they played hell with the identity of the people. That there was a change coming and that the change was coming in what is generally termed the Enlightenment. And um, does that still hold? How does that relate us to history in historical terms? We have 200,000 years of our existence on this planet. Where do we stand? Is there need for a new uh, is the, the pattern of the American pattern that's been taken over with capitalism and with the Enlightenment and with the institutions of democracy and so forth a pattern that's good for the ages? Is there a chance that it is coming up against certain limitations, inherent contradictions, either economically or otherwise, that would call for an alternative, much the way the United States was an alternative to the Anjan mm -hmm. regime? Or is the pattern that mostly is being followed by the world now with the implosion of the Soviet Union and that sort of thing, good for the ages, and well, the well, and their claim to the historical legitimacy right. is valid. Right now, how, so how do we deal with that? Uh, yeah, I think if you, you can understand. And you told me this show is about twenty four hours, yeah, no, because that's about no, what it's going no, 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 to take to begin just saying, to answer those questions. So let's let's try to. I mean, let's come you back. Understand to, what I'm I do, saying. I do. But okay. let's come back to your. Uh, you know, we, we we've talked about two eras of democracy. Yeah, well, yeah. the ancient world, Athens, Sparta, Thebes, and then the Roman Republic. And then we've talked about a thousand years of, they're not dark ages, but they're ages in which there was feudalism and tyranny. Then we're talking about a renaissance, the birth of capitalism, and the coming of Protestantism, and, and the growth of large scale societies. Okay, okay? Yeah, and yeah. that brings us yeah. to the mm -hmm. 18th century. Uh -huh. And the 18th century, as you say, that's the age of enlightenment. But yeah. the thing about these terms like renaissance and enlightenment yeah. and yeah. industrial age, yeah. they're not causes, they're products. They come not at the, the beginning of a period. They come the at the end of a period. The result of larger development. The Enlightenment yeah. summed up and distilled what for 200 years mm -hmm. had been the Protestant Revolution, okay. the Liberal Revolution, the Property Revolution, yeah, right. and the Capitalist Revolution, right. and the re Revolution of Science, so like the gestation? rise of science. Is it a and when the, when the Enlightenment mm -hmm. comes out, yeah. the Enlightenment is a celebration of science. Yeah. It's a celebration of productivity. Yeah. It's a celebration of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It's a celebration of individualism. So it's something that actually culminates a long long process that was underway. Can we, can we associate that, uh, that long process of historical mm. development with the gestation in a biological metaphor? We were gestating? We, I think that's a good, uh, it's a good metaphor as long as gestation in, say, the human case is yeah. not just what happens in the womb, but what happens in the first 20 years to a child and to an adolescent. Well, what because by the, time the we got to, by the time we got to the Enlightenment, yeah. you know, civilization wasn't coming out of the womb yeah. into the world, it was coming out of adolescence into maturation. So it's just where it's quite, f gestation then has to include quite a lot of growth that today we'd associate with adolescence. I don't want to get too carried off into biology. It's a dangerous thing. Hitler paid, you know, house offer and things with, you know, their ideas of uh, medical me metaphors or, or, or scientific metaphors. But in a gestation, it's 22 months in an elephant, I think, and it's uh, nine months in a human being. And we've been here 200,000 years, the Homo sapien species, and we have a unique capability to extend consciousness and make the environment different that's whirled up over a long, long trail winding up Mount Sisyphus for 200,000 years, 10,000 generations. We've reached a point where with the extended consciousness that technology is, tools and technology is, and I wonder, do you think, we reached a point, it seems to me around 1970, if I'm not mistaken, I wonder how you read it from modeling, it had to be modeling, that uh, we had that the research had been led scientific or intellectual research had been led. Uh, Medici's wanted Leonardo da Vinci to make a siege machine to give them an I advantage. I feel how it was happening though. We're, we're 
expanding the compass of all these ideas and things so wide that it's hard to focus back in. And okay, maybe try we, to bring it around. And so let's, if, can we okay. bring it, because I, you're, I mean, biology is, you know, an interesting metaphor, but it, it really takes us way out here. And what we were doing was, I thought, describing a kind of trajectory of democracy from small towns in the ancient world, from small okay. cities, from Roman Republic, through the growth of these nation states in the 15th and 16th century under uh, Protestantism yeah. and capitalism, because I know yeah. we want to get back to today and where we are today. Yeah, we absolutely, and, you're right, and you're I right. Think, yeah. And I think where we are today is we are the children or grandchildren of the Enlightenment. That is to say, we live in a society that is a large scale, industrial, capitalist, and still to a large extent, Protestant society which values liberty, which By values property, which values yeah, mobility, yeah. Yeah. but which now lives with a 300 million population under circumstances where a lot of Americans no longer feel very certain that their democracy works very well I know. or that they are connected to the government that is supposed to represent them. Mm. Whether you're talking right. about the right, you know, the Tea Party and yeah. so on who have that feeling, yeah. or you're talking about the left who feel even their President Obama is no longer somehow doing what they thought he was going to do for them. An awful lot of Americans have lost I think that's a true. sense of confidence in, in the system yeah. that is supposed to represent them. Part of that's the problem of representative democracy. We always get alienated from our representatives. But part of it does have to do with where we are in the 21st century yeah. on this long trajectory well, that's from what the I was ancient polis do. through the 18th century down I just today. Wanted to today. I just wanted to extend the loop out further. Yeah. And that would be when we began as a species 200,000 right. years ago. We know this now. We know this understanding. We know neurotransmitter. We're learning. It's a gestation period where you have learning. Right. And in the, in the evolutionary process, there's steady state. You're in a steady state. And then there is a moment of qualitative, the water breaks. Well, that's good. I agree with you, And Harold. there's a qualitative transformation called punctuated equilibrium. No, and the I agree new with you. And what's are happened, we, at a state we, we are, because here's what's happened. In the last 150 years, yes, sir. there has been more change right. than in the 200,000 years and that came before. And the change is moving exponential I mean, at if, this moment. If you lived in the 14th century, mm -hmm. Take you look back, years to and you could say, pack. what happened 100 years ago is roughly what happened. What <laughs> yes, happened 200 exactly. years ago is that's nothing the point. changed. You lived in a small village in France. For 500 Best years, nothing changed. Of Absolutely nothing changed. And now uh -huh. we live in a time where a every quality. 10 or 20 years, yeah. you know, now we're talking about the internet. Now we're talking about digital technology. Right, right. Now we're talking about the cloud where all the stuff is coming out of our machines I know. and being held I up know. there. Yeah. And you know, it's yeah. awfully hard right. for even a smart, technologically competent person yeah. to keep up with all that. So the pace of change, yeah. the pace of change yeah. in our world whether it's in politics, in technology, yeah. in culture, in society, yeah. makes it very hard for individuals to feel they're really part of things and governing things. Yeah, because right. even if you're a legislator yeah. in Washington, can't you feel, I can't keep up yeah, with I'll that. I bet you there's a lot of people. I mean, who Anthony Weiner will tell you all about how yeah. hard it is to keep up with the new technology. Yeah, I know. He just had that as crazy, <laughs> all that kind of stuff that's going on and why that happens, I don't know. But that's what I was getting at. Maybe it's a time of qualitative transformation in the whole order at the order of the level of, uh, of uh, at, at a level transcended to what we read into history and so forth. I did a program, if I may, did a program, I do comprehensive people, mm -hmm. and I did Isaac Asimov, who was a polymath. He was very mm -hmm. interested in things, very, and he made the pro proposition uh, that uh, this generation, that would be our generation or the younger, with this generation, after 10,000 generations to get historical perspective, is the defining generation. Now, that's a strong statement. Probably people thought that. Maybe case, and it was just that the, that the technological extension of weapons, which has led the research, so you could get an advantage and you would work realpolitik by cap, you know, getting the grain from the other person, making your tribe strong. It's still in place and so forth. But the weapon systems, do you think they are? I'm wondering, and we want to get to the media, but uh, uh, have attained along about 1970 species lethality? Well, or is there no the point in discussing being about being lethal? No, species being, lethal. Yeah, but being species lethal, the weapons are secondary. The environment is number one. We are systematically, again, to make the connection back to the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. we are systematically through our science, through yeah. our technology, through our ability to master nature, mm -hmm. whether in agriculture or technology, we are creating an uninhabitable world. We are using nature namely science, to destroy 
our capacity to be sustained and go on. So I think the critical, it's not uh, nuclear weapons is always there and always a danger, and who knows it. They the haven't been there since about 1945. But the point is they're always there now as a threat. But the real threat today, I believe, mm -hmm. is not weapons of mass destruction, is not nuclear weapons. The threat is that in trying to advance ourselves uh -huh. in build a world in which 9 billion people can live comfortably it's the way Americans can, live, think, yeah. that we create a world that is unlivable for anyone, that is unsustainable. So the problem of sustainability, right. sustainable yes. democracy, sustainable ecology, right. sustainable right. environment, right. 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 sustainable that, development. Thank you. That's that to system me thinking. is, yeah. that is the thinking. central challenge yeah. we face. And now we come mm. to the question of, link this back to democracy. Yes, sir. The institutions we have to deal with these problems of sustainability, mm. developmental mm. sustainability, mm. ecological sustainability, are institutions built in the 17th century, mm -hmm. and they're based on one state at a time, national frontiers. Mm -hmm. All of the problems of sustainability are interdependent. All of the problems of sustainability are cross-border problems. Yeah. You can't deal yeah. with the environment in China or Portugal or New York or California right. one right. place at a time. Right. We deal with it together or not at all. Mm -hmm. But our institutions, we've got 200 sovereign states, right. many of them democratic, yeah wrestling with global problems that will not respond one state at a time. The pandemics of the health world, right. HIV, yeah. Uh, yeah. flu, right. all these things, those are global problems. Yeah. But we Go deal with them with 200 national health services, right. one right. at a time. Right. Terrorism yeah. is across borders. Right. The trouble with Al-Qaeda, the reason we have such a hard time catching up to it, mm -hmm. is that it's not a rogue state phenomenon. It's not a state phenomenon mm -hmm. at all. Al-Qaeda is a malevolent non-governmental association, a oh. malicious international organization. Yeah. It's not rooted in one place or another. Yeah. We can only deal with it together, but uh -huh. we're trying to deal with it one country at a time. We have French anti-terrorism, British anti-terrorism, right. American anti-terrorism, now we'll have Egyptian anti-terrorism. You can't do that. So we live in a world of 17th century nation-state institutions right. grappling with 21st century interdependent problems of sustainability that can't be solved one nation at a time and to come back to our discussion yeah, of yeah. democracy right democracy started in villages and towns mm -hmm. in the 15th and 16th century it went to nations yeah. but today we need it to be global yeah we need planetary democracy we either have to democratize globalization mm -hmm. or globalize democracy or democracy is right. going to be stuck inside the nation state box uh -huh. while all the problems we're dealing yeah. with are global so the mm -hmm. real yeah problem today yeah. is not just to you yeah. know get some life into representative democracy, right, right. not just to repossess our local institutions, yeah. it's to make democracy sufficiently global that it can deal with the global cross-border problems like environmentalism mm -hmm. that we face. And so far, we haven't begun to do that. That's the real challenge of the 21st century. Okay, I can see it that way. Uh, okay, that's right. It, it, so at least what that does is jacks it up and makes it possible. Norbert Wiener, who started the cybernetic thing way back in 48, uh, he, 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 uh, they coined the term cyber, it means steers, it means Greek, and he said, and they said, and he said, information overload. Information overload permits pattern recognition. So you can see patterns, and pattern mm -hmm. recognition could be thought of as systems mm -hmm. understanding, systems thinking rather than specialized. And so if you get specialized with linear regression, you can go and get so specialized out, the intellectual community, let's not say the political community, but the intellectual community can get so specialized out on a particular thing that there's nobody thinking about the whole system. Exactly thing. Or do right. we lack no, no, you're systems right. understanding? We do indeed. And we if live there's in a problem, is it would be, in a certain sense, it wouldn't be the political uh, realm or even the, the banking or the business realm that would be at fault, you wouldn't after all it's linking expect them. you wouldn't it's expect, connecting them. No, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect a lion not to eat an antelope. I mean there's a thing, there's a certain kind of character. It's the intellectuals. Where is the intellectual leadership to thinking systems and relating things together, including the political, what has to be subsumed, presenting the large patterns? Where are the large patterns of systems thinking, of thinking about the whole evolutionary okay, process? Let me let me respond. And where to do they come here's from? Here's where we are. Just as in democracy, mm -hmm. we've gone from people governing themselves in small assemblies and in town meetings to representation and folks over there yeah. doing it, and we kind of vote for them once in a while, and otherwise we watch. Yeah. Politics is a spectator sport, not yeah. much more. So too in the realm of knowledge. Okay. Knowledge has so expanded, science yes. has so expanded, that we've tended to specialize 
professionalized, vocationalized. Let's put the biologists in one silo Absolutely. and the string physicists in another or and the, the political CIA scientists and the in one won't talk and the artists other. in another. Yeah, we yeah, all live yeah. in silos. Not unfortunately, but we live in silos because the world is so large and so many things are happening that to yeah. make sense of it, yeah. we climb into a silo, or at least I can understand this part. But what's missing is the it's people systems. who can connect the silos. Well, you do Conne system I, I try. If I do, I, try. I think you're we one try. of the... Where are the systems but it's hard. thinkers? But it's hard Where because there? there's so much knowledge yeah, but that if you're a systems thinker, the people in the silos say, yeah, well, that's very yeah, broad in general, but you don't know enough of what's happening exactly here to really get it. Exactly, that's what happens. So it gets harder and harder to be in... It's harder and harder to be a systems thinker in a world Mm -hmm. where there's so much that needs to be related, Back so much that needs to be networked. You can relate to Mr. Norbert Wiener saying uh, information overload permits pattern recognition. It permits systems thinking, and the intellectuals, I don't know, they were interested in getting a tar you want to get a tenured position with security and buy a yacht or whatever you want to do. You, the way to do that with all the money being held in so small hands is that the, the financing of the whole system and so forth is done by a few people, bankers who control all the economics. They're all, you can divide and conquer the intellectual community sure. like you did, uh, and they're doing that. Well, here's Where the, is systems thinking? Well, here, well, here, uh, You're let, with let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. This. Let me give you an example from economics. The economists have a great way to go into a silo. Their silo is about private profit. Mm -hmm. It's about stakeholders in the corporate realm. Mm -hmm. It's about making money and so on. And what about the social costs of all those? What yeah, about the, the externalities? Well, that, but see what they call yeah. it? They call yeah. it external. That's yeah. external. That's not <laughs> our yeah, thing right. to deal Including with. All and that that's pollution. their way yeah, of yeah. writing off yeah, uh, all of the important cross-border consequences of their activity. Yeah. But you can't blame them because they're saying, look, I, we, I got enough to make my stakeholders right, happy. Exactly. You might, you, exactly. you want me to make God's conscience happy? <laughs> yes, you want right. me to make mankind's needs happy? Like, sorry, too much. Yeah. Can't do that. And even a new president like President Obama yeah. comes into power to and tries to make connections, yeah. tries to link things, but finds that the various special communities, whether it's this special interest community of the automobile industry or the unions, on the other hand, or whether it's the energy lobby or the oil lobby, they are so powerful mm, that his attempt to say, I'm president of all Americans, mm -hmm. I'm going to bridge them, that turns out to be simply give more power. So it's very, yeah, very right. hard to and either think systemically or to govern yeah. systemically okay. in the world we live in. And that is, as you rightly say, the challenge we face. Yeah, but we don't, and we don't, that's what I'm saying is it's, it's becoming more concentrated as we talk, the power and the wealth, and uh, this idea of uh, where is the systems thinking? You're, you're associated with a thing called Demos. You have Civ World. You've done a lot of work. You're a pioneer. Mm. You are a system thinker, I would submit. You're thinking in very broad terms, and that's what exactly the intellectual community should be doing. But it seems to me the critique of things in a, in a, in a comprehensive way, that's understanding things comprehensive ra rather than developing a specialized take on things, whether it's political or economic or social or ladies or blacks or whatever like that. Uh, there's no, where are the systems thinking uh, examples coming from the intellectual community that could bring uh, the fo the focus of the realities that are emerging. We want to talk about North Africa. We want to talk about Libya. What's going on in the politics, the Congress, presidential election? Those kind of things all matter. But where is the systems thinking and systems thinkers that we can repair to to get a sense of what's going on comprehensively, understanding what's going on in the evolution of events on this part of the universe? In 1755. Okay. The philosophs in France mm -hmm. had the, to us today, absurd notion <laughs> that you could collect all human knowledge yeah. into a great Wikipedia's encyclopedia. Wikipedia's got that task. The yeah. great They're encyclopedia. Yeah. And in 1755, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you published in 30, 40, 50 volumes the great encyclopedia, and they really thought that in that compendium they contained all knowledge, and to some extent they had. They did a pretty good job, mm -hmm. but that's because knowledge at that time was so limited. Imagine today mm -hmm. an encyclopedia of any size. Wikipedia could is have trying, all, aren't but not all. I'm talking yeah. about all knowledge. Those are subjects. Those are a bunch of articles. Yeah. I'm talking about a synthetic thing that brings together and right. relates all human knowledge. Each one of 
those that used yeah. to be a sense is now a book. A book <laughs> right. is a collection. No, it's a, a collection. tome. <laughs> so you can't do it anymore. It's, yeah. it's too hard to do. Uh -huh. And if somebody like me or other people like Bill McKibben in the yeah, environmental yeah, McKibben, yeah, area yeah, yeah. try to synthesize, people say, you do that by being too abstract, by being formalistic, by leaving too much out. And the Jack more you put in, the harder none, it yeah. is to yeah. do that. So it's, yeah. it's very hard. And yeah. I understand yeah. that people who are in the silos say, mm. Yeah, you make connections, yeah. but they're superficial. That doesn't yeah. you don't really understand right. what we're doing. Yeah. You can no longer get it all into a compendium. Right. And that's the problem. And Is yet in terms of here's here's why it's a problem. I don't think it's in terms of knowledge it's such a problem, but in terms of action it is. And here's the relationship oh, between the knowledge practical. and action. Yeah. Because the basis yeah. of our knowledge uh -huh. has to become the basis of our action. We have yeah. to make decisions. Yeah. So you have to know enough to make decisions. But if knowledge is all siloed, mm -hmm. all separated into segments, right and no one person can know it all, how can you make judgments about allocating resources? Yeah. How can you make judgment about what kind of scientific research to yeah. do? How can you make judgment about what you teach in high school science courses yeah. when knowledge is so vast that nobody can make those connections? And that's the challenge we face, and as a result, we need more synthesizers mm. and synthetic systems thinkers than ever but it's harder and harder to do that. And as somebody who tries to do it, yeah, you do. I acknowledge there are a lot of problems with doing it. You have to you end up leaving a lot out. Uh -huh. When you have 40 volumes that's a compendium of all human knowledge, yeah. that's great. But when you have, as I just received in the mail, <laughs> a notice about 400 volumes that do nothing more than bring together some literary criticism. <laughs> 400 <laughs> volumes of literary criticism. You just in that worth, that means 4 million volumes of English do. literature, which means right. 400 million right. volumes right. of right. world literature. Okay, well then it becomes... So it gets, it's, it's, it's very tough for the so Species. The, it's very, let me yeah, put it this way, Harold. Yeah. It's very tough yeah. for the human species mm -hmm. to keep up with the output of their brilliant minds over uh -huh. these generations and generations. Right. And what we're trying to do is keep up with ourselves. Yeah. And we're having a very hard time doing that. But in a unique way, I would suggest. And Mr. Uh, Asimov was a pretty brilliant fellow. He thought a lot. He, the only thing he could never get his mind around was economics. He couldn't understand the economics. And that informed so much of it and everything. But he said, I think there's something to be said for that. And I think we could look for clues for that in that the weapons did become, I do believe, not by 1945, and measure things against 200,000 years of the existence of this species and extending consciousness and get a big picture. Uh, they became, they didn't become, uh, in 40, uh, you know, uh, he, James Joyce had Daedalus say, history is a nightmare of injustice from which I'm attempting to awaken. Is there any chance we may be privileged or condemned or however you want to see it to be living at the definitive generational moment in the evolution of consciousness, what I'm trying to get at, that there's something that the weapons became so deadly that if they're to be unleashed as they were in war throughout all of human history in the name of realpolitik and so forth, that it would mean the end of our species in a war sense. And if so, is there anything on the adverse side that might be something to which we could repair to try to get a hold of some equally existential alteration in terms of the ability to provide life support and so forth to the human society. Maybe, as Fuller would have suggested, we may actually be transcending, transcending material scarcity as an ontologic reality through the use of good mm. design. What's is there anything in there? What is definitive about the moment in which we live and different from other moments is that probably for the past century or so, starting yeah. with World War I, starting yeah. with the development of modern technology, starting in 1939 with Einstein's letter to Roosevelt saying, I have the basis in physics for what could be a powerful atomic well, weapon, the beginning of the atomic, to atomic weapon, that we live in times when we are now capable right. of ourselves ending our existence and the existence and sustainability of Earth, not just through weapons, but through overcrowding, yes. through the ruination of our environment, through creating a world in which people can't eat any longer, there's not enough food, a world in which there's not enough water, um. through our efforts. And what's critical is that hasn't, for a long time, in the, in, in the year 1000, you mm. lived in a village, your village might be wiped out by you know, invasion. Well, are you just making but you didn't worry about human beings being what right. we are. So, what's definitive? Are you making a Malthusian argument or something? No, no, it's not no, Malthusian. Not Malthusian. It, no, no, it's definitive or in the sense. No, it's definitive no. in oh. the sense that through weapons of mass destruction, yeah. through environmental yeah. destruction, uh -huh. through overpopulation, mm -hmm. all these things mm -hmm. that have happened within the last hundred years, mm -hmm. we are at a point where 
the existence that we think about, we live with, we do well, we do badly, mm. could actually be terminated as a result of our actions. Yeah, that's and right. That is definitive. Yeah. That makes the moment it's also definitive. New. That's the and it's new. That's yeah, definitive. Right, that's that's new. never been there before. Okay, but that's and all that's on the negative. That's all. Everything you put is negative. That's okay. You put it on the negative. I personally think the uh, climate or whatever would happen would lead to political things that would lead to the unleashing of the weapons that would do us in. I mean, we could live and there'd be some straggling survivors in a kind of war, you know, climate change and all that uh, could be done. But the, the, well, the here's more the other important side. You want the other side. Let me give you the other side and, and link it back yeah, to our no, discussion. No, the positive side. And, here's, and we'll link it back to our discussion. How do we get to something positive? One word. Easy. Easy. It's okay. easy. It's very hard, but it's easy. Okay. Democracy. Okay. In the essential sense, uh -huh. take <coughs> charge again of our own lives. Take charge again of our own world, begin to make responsible decisions to sustain our environment, make responsible decisions not to permit an inegalitarian world in which rich and poor are driven so far apart that eventually they destroy each other. Which it always that has been. That is what democracy is about. So that's the about awakening us from being once again in charge of the world and not letting a world we yeah. design and produce uh -huh. burly burly inadvertently destroy us. We have to take control of our destiny that we've allowed to run out of hand, and that's what democracy is about. Mm -hmm. It's about being in charge again, making wise decisions, mm -hmm. prudent decisions together that are life-enhancing, spirit-enhancing decisions, and not the destruction of those things. Most of what's bad today, most of what's wrong, mm -hmm. happens not because we will it, mm -hmm. but because we're not paying attention, because we're being selfish, mm -hmm. because we're simply not able to focus on our survival. And mm. when we once again, through mm. our democratic institutions, say we are responsible for human survival, mm. we are responsible for the welfare of our neighbors around the globe, we are responsible for justice and equality, mm. when we make that decision and take yeah. charge of our institutions, we will be in a position to thwart the consequences of our unthought actions for the last 100 years. Well, there's something to be said for what you say. If we could do that, particularly if we could have the democracy. Well, we got to do it. We if we could it. become, you know, there's 100 trillion cells in the human organism, and every cell matters, and every cell needs oxygen, and it works as a system. It's a good model. Some people want to go to Gaia or something like that where they see an organism, they see it as an organism, and all that sort of thing. But I'm wondering, you say we got to get back to democracy. When did we ever have, in the true, true sense, if we're talking about every person realizing their full potential, some sort of a real realization of a process. We never had it fully, Harold. We look, haven't never had it. But look, it's always look, been unjust. When, so was my, when no, did my brain ever work? It, my you brain has never worked at 100%, but if I can get it to about 40%, yeah, I'm doing pretty I well. Know. The athletes who, these extraordinary yeah. professional athletes, their bodies work at about 60% of their maximum. Yeah. That's a whole lot better than most of us. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have to have perfect democracy. Yeah. We'll never get it. Okay, We're frail, imperfect we creatures. We need democracy. more of it. We need more okay, yeah, of it. Right. Okay, Both yeah. getting back yeah. to what we had and getting some of what we've never and had before. Yeah. But, and we don't, yeah, it doesn't okay. have to be perfect. Yeah, of course it won't be perfect. That's different. Of so course it won't be perfect. Changed? We need what's more of it. Well, the thing I would suggest, again, at an abstract level, we're talking about the weapons. I hope they don't get set off and everything, but that's a capability. So you do make a distinction between the reality and all yeah, the but institutions. Let's be practical, Harrison. It's not about the weapons won't be set off. NATO weapons aren't being set off in Libya today. NATO is setting them off as a result of decisions made by President Sarkozy and Prime Minister Car Cameron, and with President Obama more or less being complicit and saying, "Well, go ahead okay. and do it." Those are. It's not like some weird accident that you know somehow bombs are falling. Yeah, that's we right. made those decisions, but you know what? We didn't make those decisions. We they have did. here in America yeah. a War Powers Act. Yeah. It says that after 90 days, there's 60 days and 90 days, there's a series of cutoffs. Yeah. The Congress has to approve armed interventions. Came out of the Vietnam War. We're not War. doing it. We're not doing it. We're yeah. not paying attention to our own constitutional provisions. That's not democracy. No, democracy means right. we take control. My guess is if the American people are asked to vote on, do we really want to be dropping bombs in Libya? Is that in our interest? Is that necessary to national they security? They do not think that it is. They would but say But it doesn't not. matter what the people think. Well, They're we have to make it, it matter because we live in a democracy. Yeah. And if it doesn't matter, it's our fault that we let that happen. Uh -huh. It's not his. If Obama pays no attention, more power to him. That's what a president wants to do. A well, lot no, of executive authority. We have to stop him. We have to say, sorry, that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Just as Dennis Kucinich has done with his, you know, his, his several now. Dennis has uh, tried to do a lot of things. He's now put a number. Well, but he's got 180 votes for it. He got 180 votes that's for true. it in that's the Congress true. saying, we and can't it's do bipartisan. this anymore. And you got it's bipartisan. Boehner for a so thing So the up. point yeah. here is that mm -hmm. when I say bring yeah. back democracy, strengthen our democracy, okay. I'm not talking abstractly. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm saying yeah. 
follow through uh -huh. on the Democratic provisions. The War Powers Act is a congressionally authorized piece of legislation. It's that been says ignored by the executive yeah, for every every conflict since it's that's been over correct. War, right? But that's because the Cong well, well, it's newer than that. But Congress has permitted it to happen, and we have permitted. Congress not Is it the Congress that's at fault for not asserting that It is, authority? and it's our fault for not making Congress do it. And I mean, it's, it, that's the point. That's what every I said. War, we're always blaming somebody. Oh, Obama's abusing the Congress. He's not abusing. He's getting away with what he can get away with. Every executive wants to fight wars he wants to fight. Yeah. He doesn't want to worry about Congress. It's Congress's job to say, you have to worry about Congress. Well, it's to our right. job mm -hmm. to say, Congress, you better worry about it, or we're going to well, vote you Well, why have we office. let the executive run off? Everything, Gulf of Tonkin and so, you know, uh, everything's led by a war. war uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, everything is done by a big media lie in order to get into a war. Then there's mission creep, and then you're there, and now we're still, but even Mr. That, Obama is still saying he's going to keep bombing. I will be happy to agree that the media have a lot to do with yeah. this, that privatization has a lot to do with it, that indifference has a lot to do with it, uh, and in that sense, the American people are complicit in all the things they complain about yeah. because they let them happen. But yeah. until the day comes when you try to go to the polls and you're not allowed to vote, yeah, until okay. the day comes when, on this show, when yeah. we're done, we get arrested <laughs> yes, for what right. we said, right, we yeah. still live That's in a right. democracy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it may not be much of a democracy, it right. may not be, but it's a democracy. Uh -huh. And if it's not acting mm -hmm. to stop illegitimate war, right. if it's not acting to keep money out of politics, that's not their fault. That's our fault. Well, okay. that's like we're not doing enough because we'd rather be doing our job or doing this and making well, money than doing our things. Well, what about the role that if we're so talking we about? So we have to come back yeah. to animating. Okay. Our but responsibility certain, it, okay, and taking responsibility that. and when doing we the say, work. If we, if I understand that, and when we say in the way when we, when you're talking about, let's say the people mm -hmm. or something, but what about the role? Is there any special role or anything? Because I got talking about the intellectuals. What about the intellectuals? Where is the critique of things coming from the intellectual community? Community that can be truly in revolution. It's we've right here. It's, here. Had, it's here today. You revolution. and I talking about it. Bill McKibben talking. There are plenty of people talking about it, but it's not, I mean, it's not that the message isn't there for those who want to listen. A lot of Americans aren't taking the time to listen, yeah. and they don't want to go. This program will be buried in you know thousands of channels. Yeah. A few people will watch. Mm. Most won't, yeah. but those who want to can find it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be streamed. It's out there. They want to hear what Harold Channer has to say. They can listen every day. They want to hear what I have to say. Yeah, yeah. They can listen here. They can listen there. Yeah. But we can't just say, well, that's the fault of the media and big money because we are there in a society to be heard. We have to take responsibility ourselves. We're all in this mess together. And well, what I'm suggesting is that democracy is not about leaders doing the right things. It's well, about citizens doing the right things. The well, quality, the the quality the of right? it, yes, they can. Okay. As, okay. Lo as, long as, okay. as long as they're not putting a gun at your head, putting manacles on your yeah, hand, right. putting tape over yeah. our mouths, it's us, not them, not it, that's responsible. We still do live in a democracy, and if it's not working, it's our fault, not somebody else's fault. The media fault. matters, doesn't it? You know, it think, matters. Did you ever read Vin, uh, Vance Packard and say how easily they could manipulate uh, sure the po population to buy cornflakes? Sure, it matters. But I have enough faith in yeah. human nature. I have yeah. enough faith in human reason uh -huh. to believe that whatever we're being manipulated by advertising and marketing and the media and by Fox or MSABC or yeah. you name your poison, mm -hmm. Most people are capable of thinking this through and saying, I don't really like that. I don't agree with that. I want to hear the other side. That's what I believe. If you don't yeah. believe that, if we're all just sheep yeah. to yeah. be herded mm -hmm. and pushed around, yeah. then there never would have been democracy because there are always people who want to control democracy. Is it worthwhile? There are always people trying to manipulate democracy. Is it worthwhile talking about things like we can destroy the environment and McKibben and all that and the externality? Why bother talking about all that if you're not going to talk about it, you know, or is it important to bring up the fact that there's something existentially new, like, for instance, weapons that can wipe out the whole species? It's new. Uh, to get the attention of people to think about things in a different kind of way than historically. Well, there is, in, of course you're right. Of course there is in a way. But another way, if you lived in the ancient world, yeah. you lived in a city like Carthage, mm. The Roman legions might come over Carthage and destroy every man, woman, I know, and Salt, child, mm -hmm, and yeah. all the buildings. Yeah, yeah. And as far as you're concerned, your world, your planet was yeah, over. Yeah. So you know that. I mean, yes, now it's the whole world, it's the planet. Yes. But nonetheless, I think we are always faced with the reality of our own mortality, the reality that whole towns, yeah. whole civilizations can fall. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change the fact that we have made one fundamental change in the last two hundred thousand years. We have gone from being creatures of dictators, creatures of nature, and creatures of necessity to people who have some say 
through democracy and what happens. And if now, with uh -huh. that say, we don't use that saying, we complain, oh, it's necessity, it's dictators, it's yeah. manipulative yeah. media. Yeah. That's our fault mm -hmm. because we have now a blessing that for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years the human race didn't have some capacity to impact and speak to the world we're going to live in. And if we don't like the world we live in, don't blame others. That's your fault. That's your fault. That's my fault. That is, so we have a new capability through design in a certain sense of being able to bring about a world where those who have not been included in the democratic yes. capability to where we can to the maximum involve people in a way in which they can be involved in it because of the life support of capabilities that the technology on a positive side. If I right. may, That's Bucky right. Fuller used to talk about ephemeralization, doing more with less. We got a computer, you're talking about how we're gonna rape the environment. It sounds Malthusian to me, or Ehrlich or something like that, but we're gonna go. And, and uh, the, the, the microchip is a good thing. It used to be a room this size with vacuum tubes to get one megabyte of memory, and now it's going down to where it's gonna be going through the bloodstream. There's progress. 175,000 tons of copper cable to go from London to London in New York. Now it's down to a 400 pound transponder. There, we can do more with less. There's an ephemeralization. We have the capability yes, where we if we design and we take account That's of that, it. if we think systems, we have a capability of providing for everybody and ecology that is equally existentially significant as the destructive capability, mm -hmm. and it's never mentioned. There we may go. have transcended, it would be worth putting out, we may have transcended tech, uh, material scarcity as an ontologic reality. We were involved within a condition of scarcity. We may have transcended at the level of capability. It would be worth mentioning once in a while that the condition, we may have the means by which we could get at an effective operating manual right. for well, Spaceship Earth that takes things here, systems into yeah. account. Where is you that? That's the, coming from the intellectuals. Not and just, where not is just, it? But look, we got this, right? Yeah, that's true. The technologies that's in here, as you rightly said, yeah. used to fill not just this room, <laughs> right. but this building right. anymore. And this thing goes faster by a million times than any processor I'm did Isn't that 40 wonderful? years ago. And it's great, but, yeah. but, yeah. we are in possession of a technology that is a tool for many different things, and it often reflects who we are. You can use this uh -huh. as they did in Tahir Square yeah. to bring people out, to right. communicate, to demonstrate, to spread blogs yeah. and free people from tyranny. That's one possible well, use. And yeah. it was done that uh, way. Yeah. You know, yeah. Okay, yeah. You can yeah. also use it to access shopping yeah. and do nothing but shop. You can make this an electronic mall. You can also use this to access pornography. One mm. third of all hits on the web today are pornographic. I'm not approved, that's fine, but it seems to me a sort of waste Does of the me, new yeah. technology yeah. to yeah. pursue the world's oldest profession yeah, we might on it and, about and that nothing else. And, let loose in and the world. let's talk what about you, you know, so Anthony yeah. Weiner. I yeah. mean, Anthony Weiner can use this to help organize his constituency yeah, to make a, lot a difference. A lot of good things. Or yeah. he can send pictures of himself in his underpants yeah. on it. We can do both <laughs> those yeah. things. Right. And you it's can't say it's not the technology, it's how we use it. No, but I only brought it up because it isn't all negative. No, no, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. Is there, how does it add? up systemic how do you get a pattern it depends on us Harold. Okay. it depends on well, us. how do you like the idea is it, well let me ask you specifically is it possible ever that we are going to realize that with technology and capability and with the ability of good design and all these kind of things that we're going to be able to have a universally uh, just system where democracy is not just for the few or something like that, or for the, the lobbyists, or for the special Yeah, interests, the answer to your question is yes. And that it's yes. going to be answer, a real fulfilling the answer to your of question the full yes. democracy. And because when, if not now, because is that let possible? Because, let me answer your question, Harold. The technology that is in the digital world, the technology that's in the web, the technology that is there is a democratic technology. Okay. It's technically a point-to-point -point technology, like mm. a telephone. Yeah. Newspapers, Classical television yeah. and radio are top down. Yeah. There are people broadcasting down. I read my paper and I listen to the editors mm -hmm. of that paper. I watch TV and I watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox, whatever my preference mm -hmm. is, but somebody else is basically pushing down what's there. Mm -hmm. This technology, this mm -hmm. internet, mm -hmm. is a lateral technology. Mm -hmm. We talk to each other. Everybody yeah. can have a blog. Right. Everybody can have a website. That's that encouraging, makes it don't terrific. you think? It's yeah. wonderful. I do too. But is yeah. it a technology that we use 
for universal pornography, universal commercialism, universal buying and selling, or do we use it for universal justice, universal education, well, universal right now culture? They're using it to, and right that's now, again the power our structure choice. is using it to, dr to direct drones to kill babies in Libya. No, but that's just, that's Are not we just the power structure. It's not no. just the power structure. No, but you we're using it to access pornography, which is okay, but that's how we're not using it to access culture, access justice, access education. We're using it to access you shopping don't think, channels. What about the so idea? So that's us. That's okay, not, that's what about not somebody the idea? else. Fuller, used to, Fuller was a comprehensivist. He was major. He was a big thinker. He was thinking about things. And he said, what we need, and what about the idea? If you get a new system, let's say, and how big can we think? And where are we? I, are we at a time of coming to the end of the human experience? Are we coming into a new relationship to the universe? In biology, you have a concept of punctuated equilibrium, where the new appears. If you transcend material scarcity to the level of capability, See, but, but then Harold, your Harold, formation Harold, Harold, of capital, I, I got a challenge everything here. has to when be When you different. say punctuated equilibrium, That's and I'm out there, I switch the set. See, I say, okay, I'm going to watch another show. I was sort of enjoying this book, Punctuated Equilibrium. Buck no, no, no. no, but what I want to say is we yeah. need to bring this to where people are. Mm -hmm. And where people are is they feel alienated. Right. They feel desperate. They yeah. feel they've lost touch with their government. Yeah. They feel their country's been taken away with them. Yeah. From them, they feel that the knowledge is expanding so fast that even if they're educated, they can't get it. Yeah. They feel even if they go to college, they don't get jobs right. and so on. So what we need to do is translate the broad picture yeah. we're trying to draw yeah. back into, into practical, the yeah. practical yeah. concerns yeah. that people you know who are you know are having a tough time yeah. you know are trying to deal with. And that's why I keep coming back to this word okay. democracy. Okay. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. what that says mm -hmm. is, if you feel mm -hmm. America doesn't belong to you anymore. If you feel this or government Egypt, has or run or away yeah. from you, yeah. if you feel that there's more information than you can ever get hold of, mm -hmm. if you feel that your kids did all the right things in college and can't get decent jobs, mm -hmm. there are two ways you can respond. You can say, you can whine, you can complain, yeah. you can blame people, you can mm -hmm. find people to complain about, mm -hmm. or you can ask, how can I use the power mm -hmm. that I have in this new world mm -hmm. of technology and democracy yeah, yeah to correct these things myself, not whine about others, yeah. but empower myself. How can I create a world where there are more jobs, not just wait to say, where are the jobs? Well, there is might the private be sector doing, is the public sector? Wait There's, a minute, wait a minute, need to, Stop. We need to have this ourselves as our task, not blame somebody else. Well, you else threw it out so lovingly, so easy. Yeah. We need jobs, that's all yeah. Mr. Obama says. Lord Kane said, you're gonna be confronted with technological displacement of labor in the productive process. We have a tremendous ability to produce things that are ecologically good and so forth, and we don't need the workers. And we just assume the only way to distribute buying power to the masses of people is for them to have a, uh, a job a master's estate that owns all the assets. Quite right. I okay? wrote a book. So you don't, you can't just throw out a thing and say, "Well, we got to get jobs." You have to have an alternative yeah, way of forming the, but capital. but there is one. But there is one. You have one. to have a form. Uh, those are there, and they're up to us. Distributing demand. Those, those are, are not just. Systems. Those are there, and they're up to us. The alternative energy Where world. Where are the answers Alternative from? housing. There are lots of areas that could produce a lot of jobs. Even rebuilding America's infrastructure. Even rebuilding. America's infrastructure would create an awful lot of jobs. Right now, the problem is that there aren't jobs. The problem is that private capital doesn't need jobs to produce profit. And they won't. They won't. That they, means they the government that. has to do it. That okay. means the government no, the has to do it, and we have to do it. Ben, it's structural. You're not going to be able to only distribute demand to the masses of the people through their having a job on masses of state when the technology is increasingly responsible, and you don't need the workers to create the vast majority of what's to be created in the production. You need a new economic order and a way of forming capital. For, yeah, for that, you're and right, you need a way right. to distribute in, in demand theory, other than jobs. So to just say, let's theory, make a lot no, of jobs, in, in theory, is right. already in too theory, limited. In theory, you're right. No, in theory, in practice, we need no, but, it now. No, but in theory, you're right, but you can't go to people who are trying to get jobs now and say, as soon as we have a new economic theory, and 